Hey everybody, welcome back to another Nature's Always Right episode with Stephen Cornett. Today we're gonna to get into some advanced composting concepts utilizing the four months of rabbit manure and bedding that my neighbor has accumulated here in my barn. And it's a pretty awesome agreement where she's just jumping it off. I'm gonna turn it into soil and then we're gonna to get to share the soil in the spring for our gardens. So if you don't know, rabbit manure is a fantastic compost. You can use it right away. It doesn't need to be hot composted before it's used in your garden. Uh, so just like alpaca manure is like that as well. So it's really great stuff. Now, what we're gonna do today is some different natural farming concepts, and we'll also be adding in some other microbes, inoculants, food for the microbes uh, that we can all find around our house or you can make at home. And I'll be telling you all about that. In addition to adding in some of my Bokashi compost that I've been saving up the last four months, I haven't had a compost pile, and that's one of my favorite things about Bokashi, especially for home gardeners, or even on a larger scale if you're storing it in 55 gallons. It's a way to store compost, saving it for later when you're able to build a compost pile uh, and get a lot more soil that way. So I hope that this will add some more detail and context to some of the older aerobic composting videos that I've done and hopefully will give you some other techniques that you can take away to use in your own home or garden. Okay guys, so the first thing we're gonna go over is all the different ingredients I'm gonna use and why I'm using them. Uh, and then we'll build the pile together, get it moist, and I'll describe a, a bunch of those details as well. So our goal here is to build a nutrient-rich and microbial-rich compost. So there's a lot of different things and ways that you can do that. Of course, just using straw and manure will create a good compost, but we wanna take it to the next level and has something that is basically gonna be like a fertilizer plus a microbial inoculant. So the first things that I will show you are things that I made back in San Diego. These are all natural farming inputs. So this is beetroot FPJ. FPJ stands for fermented plant juice. And basically what is done is you take uh, plant material, either new growth or from the actual fruit of a plant like tomatoes or berries or uh, you can use bananas, or, or you can use anything. Um, if you, and what you do is you ferment it one to one with brown sugar. That extracts the uh, different plant hormones, uh, the microbes living on the plant, um, and even some nutrients, and stores that for later use. And then we can dilute that uh, and then add it to our compost or actually spray it onto our plants. And I'll show you guys some videos about how to make this stuff in the future. If you want to learn how to do it though, you can look up Chris Trump or Drake, Eric Weinert. Um, they have some great videos on YouTube teaching you how to do that. Um, then I have some calcium phosphate, which is made from vinegar and the bones of animals. Uh, my other one I have is water soluble calcium that's made from vinegar and eggshells. So then I also have some OHN that my friend gave me and this is made from distilling an alcohol, um, five powerful herbs, uh, garlic, ginger, licorice, uh, and a couple others. And then I also have some old fish and seaweed fertilizer that we'll use up. Uh, and then of course, also you see all these buckets around me. This is the Bokashi compost that I've been making for the last four months. This is all of our food scraps. Each one of these buckets weighs probably 50 or more pounds. I've got two videos on Bokashi to help you. I'm gonna put all the links to these extra videos that are gonna help you as well as um, different uh, products or something that may help you down in the description below. Um, one of the products that I use is Bokashi Grains. And this is made by SD Microbe, a friend of mine. And I used to actually give him some of the vegetables that he made because he, he inoculates this not only with lactobacillus and EM1, but um, different natural farming inputs and minerals as well. And now Jared's Real Food, uh, who's an amazing regenerative farmer down in San Diego, is uh, providing him those plants to make that. So it's an excellent product. And these grains are what you use to ferment your food scraps in these buckets. Bokashi is amazing because you can ferment anything, even meat or literally anything, a cake. So um, this is how I've been saving up all my material for the future so that I can make really good compost. And this helps you get better temperatures. It's adding in more microbes and a lot more nutrients, and nothing is being lost to the air. It's all being broken down and stored in these buckets before you add it to your compost. So it's, I love Bokashi composting. 
huge fan. And if you want to get 10% off on the ST Microbes grain, uh, there's a link in my description below. You'll go to my website and you can buy it directly from my website now and use the code nature77 to get 10% off. The last thing, I don't have any azomite right now. Typically I like using azomite for my minerals. That is uh, from a volcanic ash deposit from Utah, but I don't have that. So what we're gonna do is use sea salt actually. And sea salt has you know around 70 or so trace minerals. Always use sea salt, especially in your diet. Morton's salt, that is absolute garbage poison. Never ever eat that or use that in baking or anything. Always sea salt. So we'll use sea salt in a very fine dilution. We're gonna uh, mix it into water and dissolve it and then uh, water that in to the compost pile. And that's gonna add more trace minerals along with the seaweed that I have in here. Minerals, of course, are very good for your plants and you want the microbes, if they can break them down first before you add them to your garden, uh, it'll be more available to the plants. Uh, and also these minerals will feed microbes, help the populations grow uh, more diverse and more healthy as well. So I will be showing you the dilutions that I'm gonna use for all of this stuff. And luckily, except for the salt, uh, all this stuff, if you do too much it's, or too little, it's not gonna really hurt anything, so don't worry. Um, the final thing that we'll be adding is leaf matter, leaf mold, and some forced soil. Um, I'm blessed to now have a lot of woods on my property. Um, and if you don't know, leaf mold in a forest has the best microbes in the world naturally occurring, and as well as leafs being some of the best carbon that you can use. So making your own leaf molds fantastic. You can just make a huge pile and start composting it, add it into your compost. You'll inoculate a ton of microbes. So we'll be adding that in as well um, to increase the microbial diversity in our compost. Now, because this will be heating up, um, some microbes will, uh, these microbes will die off, some will survive, um, but in general, we will increase the diversity which is what we want to have in our gardens or our farms. Now there's even more fun things that we could add into our soil, but I just don't have them. I'll be making them this season. Um, some different Jadam methods and some different Korean natural farming methods that I could incorporate in here as well, but I just don't have it yet. So that first spot you just saw me dig, I actually chose to get away from that because there's a lot of pine needles there and pine needles are a bit acidic and I just rather not have that in my compost. So I'm choosing an area here that has a lot less. I actually chose this spot because check this out, there's some deer droppings here. So we'll add that in as well. That'll be some extra goodies for us. So watch as I pull this back, you can see decomposing leaves. And as you go lower and lower, you can see that there's some really nice soil here and it smells amazing. And that is from the decomposing leaf matter. So what I'm looking to do is just scrape off that first inch and get some of that in there. And then I want to get leaves as well. Now, one of the amazing things about the leaf mold is you see, you're seeing those white strands. That is fungal hyphae. So the leaf mold soil is highly active with fungal development. And that's something we really want in our compost and in our garden soils as it's responsible for cycling nutrients and so many different processes. So um, this is one of the reasons why leaf mold soil is just so beneficial. What I'm going to do now, since I exposed all this soil, um, I want to recover it up uh, to keep the soil healthy and so it can start rebuilding that soil that I took away, as well as preventing erosion. All right, so the next thing I'm going to do is prepare this pile. I'll spread it out a little bit more flat so that I can evenly distribute the nutrients I want to add, and then we'll pile it back up into a large uh, mound. And the reason you want a big mound, if you're making compost at home, it needs to be at least one cubic meter or one cubic yard at least, so that the center mass has the ability to heat up as much as possible. Uh, and that is just a rule to live by when you're making compost. Uh, the bigger the pile, uh, the more heat in the larger area that it will be. So um, getting that heat is going to allow you to break down the pile faster, um, as well as break up any and destroy any pathogens or weed seeds or things like this. You want to have between 130 and 160 degrees Fahrenheit 
and that's the ideal pile temperature. So typically when I'm building a compost pile, I like to build layers of carbon, put greens on top of it, layer, 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 watering it the whole way through. But because we've been piling this here for so long, it's just gonna be too much work to try to, to maneuver that all around. So that's why I try to get it you know, decently flat here. And then I will just add all of my inputs on the top of this. I'll be mixing uh, most of it except the Bokashi grain in water. So it'll help it to seep down into the deeper layers below. And we need to add a bunch of moisture to this as well uh, to get the microbes activated and working for us. So first thing, I'm just gonna sprinkle out Bokashi grains. If you have a small pile, you know, you would just do a couple handfuls at each layer. I'm just gonna try to spread this evenly over my entire huge pile here. Okay, so going off the formula for making JMS, Jadon Microbial Solution, that uses salt as the mineral to feed, so I just went off that formula. Um, I'm gonna do 25 gallons of water. So based upon that, I need 0.6 ounces per five gallon of water. And highly recommend getting the Jadon book. I'll have a link for that in the description as well. Um, but this is just a really conservative amount. We don't wanna do too much salt. There we go, 0.6 ounces. And if you're curious what that looks like, this is just a regular solo cup and it's going about up to there. But you should definitely weigh it if you're gonna do this. So 0.6 ounces per five gallons of water. And if I was doing a small compost pile, um, like, a, like one cubic yard, I'd probably only do this much for the whole thing. Just to play it safe. So now we're gonna add in water. Now the, the water that you saw me fill up is actually city water. I unfortunately found out that the hookup down there uh, is actually connected to my neighbor's property. This whole place used to be one property originally. Um, so it's actually city water, so I'm using my Boogie Blue to filter out some of that chlorine and whatever else bad stuff could be in there. You know, using clean water is, um, you know, whether you're drinking it for your own body or for your plants is pretty important in my opinion. So this is what I use. Okay, so now I'm gonna do that four more times. And I've just broken this out in my mind into five little quadrants so I can dump this out as evenly as possible. Okay, so I ended up doing four wheelbarrow loads and I just determined that just from seeing how much um, I wanna have covered out here. You know, I'm trying to make a stack about four inches on top of this uh, to have a bunch of material in here. So I'll just spread this out evenly. Okay guys, so the next things that I'm gonna add are all my FPJs and all the Korean natural farming nutrients. Now, because we're doing a soil drench, the dilution doesn't need to be perfect. If you're spraying this on the leaves of your plants, you would wanna follow the, the formulas more exactly. So typically most things are diluted one to 1,000, sometimes one to 500, one to 2,000, depending on what you're doing. I'll do everything around one to 1,000, um, which is gonna be like a tablespoon in a five gallon. This is all approximated. This is not exact. And to save myself some time, I'm gonna put all the FPJs in uh, at the same time, fill it with water, and then water that in. And then I'll do my seaweed and kelp. And then finally, I will show you dumping out the Bokashi and then making the final pile. And one other really important thing uh, to do when you're doing FPJ is always have uh, some brown rice vinegar or some type of vinegar in it um, because that's going to help eliminate certain issues that the excess sugar can have and um, it's just always something that's recommended uh, by Master Cho and, and everybody else in natural farming. So I'll also be adding that uh, in the same amount, one tablespoon. So like I said, because this is a soil drench, it doesn't need to be exact. So I'll just do base roughly a tablespoon for each element and it will be actually a little bit stronger than one to 1000 once I add all the different FPJs. This is one of the really cool things about natural farming is everything doesn't have to be totally exact. It's not like using a chemical fertilizer. Okay and I will do five buckets of this as well. So now the final step after dumping 50 gallons of nutrients and inoculants 
we're gonna do the final thing, which is the Bokashi. Now be sure to watch my Bokashi video to learn how to do this in depth. Uh, but this has been fermenting for over two weeks, all of these different buckets. And if I smell it, it smells great actually. It, um, I can smell some of the different veggies and the citrus in there. Doesn't smell putrid. And that's kind of the beauty of the Bokashi is the anaerobic microbes do such a good job eating up everything that smells bad. So now what I'm gonna do is spread all these buckets out and do an even layer on the top. And actually one of these buckets even has um, a bunch of the leftover rabbit parts that me and my neighbor processed when we processed them for meat. We didn't throw anything away, the skins, the guts, the things we couldn't eat. We, I bokashi them. So that's another pretty cool thing you do with bokashi um, so that nothing goes to waste. So I'm gonna spread this all out. And then my strategy for piling everything up is I'm gonna pull from uh, the outside and go on top. Uh, and then we'll be watering it in down from the top and it should have pretty good moisture in there. I will be, of course, monitoring this with a compost thermometer. Those are super important and they really help you get better at composting, especially if you can track your temperatures. And after you turn it and observing what happens, that's a great way to learn how to become a better composter is just observe it every single day, uh, how it smells, how it looks, everything about it. Okay, so I'm gonna dump these out and then I'll do my best to, to kind of mix this pile in a little bit more and get a lot of carbon on top of this Bokashi. And Bokashi counts as greens, just so you know. At the end, I'm gonna rinse all this stuff out too, and then water all that in too. The, Boka the juice in the Bokashi is full of nutrients and microbes. And this will get a very hot center with all these goodies in here. And then I'll come and turn it, uh, depending on the temperature. And my other compost videos give some good examples of when to turn it. All right, guys, so here's what I ended up with. That pile's like maybe four feet high by about 10 feet wide. So it's a quite a big pile. The final step that I need to do is add more moisture. Uh, compost takes an incredible amount of moisture to be at the right point where the microbes can uh, reproduce, eat, and, and thrive. So I wanna bring my sprinkler down here set my sprinkler on so I don't have to sit here and water it. And then I'll come back after maybe 30 minutes and check on it, maybe move it. I'll see what's going on. If I see water start seeping out from the bottom, that's typically when I'll stop or I'll target a certain area of the compost pile to try to get that more moist. Um, typically with when there's a lot of straw in the compost, it's a little bit hydrophobic, so it kind of bounces off a bit, but um, if you water slowly over a long period of time, it will absorb. And also let me know down in the comments, do you want me to show you an update to this pile? And I can talk about its breakdown a little bit more, um, or my other videos might suffice for explaining some other details there. Hope that you guys enjoyed watching this and learned a lot of things. Uh, be sure to ask any questions you have down in the comments. Um, some of these topics might be pretty new for you, but I'd be happy to help and answer any questions. I've got links to other videos and the different things that I used down in the description to help you. Be sure to check out my website and sign up for my email list if you would like to stay in contact with me.